Good day to you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We've been reading in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, last time we read Deuteronomy chapter 20, and that was about the laws of warfare. And now we're ready to read Deuteronomy chapter 21. This is going to be about some different things, crimes and domestic relations, that type of stuff. And I am reading in the Amplified Bible. If someone is found slain, lying in the field in the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess, and it is not known who has killed him, then your elders and judges shall go out and measure the distance to the cities which are around the dead person. It shall be that the elders of the city which is nearest to the dead man shall take a heifer of the herd, one which has not been worked and which has not pulled in a yoke, And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a river valley with running water which has not been plowed or planted and shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. Then the priests, the sons of Levi, shall approach for the Lord your God has chosen them to serve him and to bless in the name, presence of the Lord. And every dispute and every assault, violent crime shall be settled by them. All the elders of that city nearest to the dead man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley, and they shall respond and say, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it. Forgive your people Israel whom you have redeemed, O Lord, and do not put the guilt of innocent blood among your people Israel, and the guilt of blood shall be forgiven them. So shall you remove the guilt of innocent blood from among you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Now this was for basically when someone has died, possibly been killed. You know, you really don't know. It says they're found slain. So you have evidence that they were killed in some manner. But you really are not sure of how or when or where. You know, why? I guess why is a better question. Um, And so this would be a process that they would go through. You know, as we know, like back in Genesis, God said that Abel's blood cried out to him. So if there's an innocent person, this this goes along with what what we say about abortion being wrong. Um, Innocent blood being spilled, that cries out to God. That is a big deal to him because we're all made in his image and someone should not just be murdered like that out of hand. So this would have been something they did to assuage that guilt from whoever, you know, even though they don't know who did it, maybe they don't have any way of finding out who did it. So it's one of those things. It'd be like an unsolved case. When you go out to battle against your enemies and the Lord your God hands them over to you and you lead them away captive and you see a beautiful woman among the captives and desire her and would take her as your wife, then you shall bring her home to your house and she shall shave her head and trim her nails in preparation for mourning. She shall take off the clothes of her captivity and remain in your house and weep mourn for her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But it shall be that if you have no delight and take no pleasure in her, then you shall let her go wherever she wishes. You certainly shall not sell her for money. You shall not deal with her as a slave or mistreat her, because you have humbled her by forced marriage. In other words, you have brought her in as a victor over her people. You have brought her in to take as a wife. And if you then decide that you're not going to keep her for whatever reason, this sounds really kind of selfish to me, but for whatever reason, there could be good valid reasons. You you can't sell her, you can't treat her like a slave or mistreat her. You have to let her go wherever she wishes to go. So. I think overall the idea there is to to reduce the amount of abuse and things that people would go through in life. But uh, 
But this is one of those things where, you know, we know back then, thousands of years ago, people, one people conquered another people and they took them into slavery. They did all kinds of things. And I think the the Lord was really against making people slaves. They It was okay to make them your laborers, your servants, kind of. But but there's a difference in having someone be your your servant and they do things for you rather than being a slave. We see that today. If we did not acknowledge that difference, then we would say we were, we're all slaves, right? Because that would mean whoever I work for, I'm a slave to them. And, and that's, now, there is a fine line there. I mean, to some degree, we may feel like slaves sometimes, but, but we're not. And I think there's differences, subtle differences here that uh, the Lord is establishing. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him sons, and the firstborn son belongs to the unloved wife, then on the day when he wills his possessions to his sons, he cannot treat the son of his loved wife as firstborn in the place of the son of the unloved wife, the actual firstborn. Instead, he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he was the beginning of his strength, generative power, to him belongs the right of the firstborn. Now, verse 15, and and sometimes the word there that they use, unloved, sometimes some people have it down as hated. But I think the real intention here, from what they say, the the uh, the intent is more of a it's not a hostile attitude, but it's more of a a kind of a rejection. And I think the real intent here is like this is just a fact. If you have two wives, which really the Lord does not promote that, but it does happen, and people do do that, and especially did that back then, they still do it today. But if you have two wives, you're human, you're going to love one more than the other. That's just the way it is. And that doesn't mean that you've totally rejected or you don't care about the other, but you're going to love one more than the other. And that's the distinction they're making here. There's the favorite wife, the favored, and then there's the less favored, okay, or the unfavored. Um, And that's a fact of life. If you have two husbands, you're going to prefer one over the other. That's going to happen. That's the way it is. We're, we're human. So here, the Lord is trying to make provisions for the uh, children to be treated fairly based on actual events and not have you, you know, twist it up in your mind and say, well, but, but this is my favorite wife, so her son, no. No, you have to be fair. You have to go with the facts the way it occurred. And the other wife had the firstborn son, so he's the one that should get the double portion of the inheritance. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or of his mother, and when they reprimand and discipline him, he will not listen to them, then his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gateway of his hometown. They shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from among you, and all Israel will hear of it and be afraid. This is a very extreme judgment, isn't it? It sounds really vicious. But the thing is, I believe... In practice here, this would have been an extremely rare event if it ever happened at all. Who would really be willing to take your child out and have the city stone them to death? I don't think that would have happened, if at all, very often. And I would say it would be an extreme, weird case if it did happen. Um... If you just look at this, parents are going to have a really hard time trying to bring their their rebellious and but it could be something that they would use to 
to sort of jerk the son in line and say, look, if you can't act, if you can't straighten up and act right, then then we have a punishment for you, you know. So it could be something they use to kind of, you know, keep keep the young man in line, keep the teenager to get him to settle down a little bit. But I, I'm I'm very doubtful that this would have happened very often, if at all. I just can't see parents really doing this. Most parents have a hard time. Discipline their disciplining their children, even even back then to some degree, you know. Now, of course, there's going to be exceptions. I'm sure that there were some people who did this, but by and large, and we're going to read later on. There is even a priest. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. In Samuel, uh, his boys are not uh, not doing right, not doing correctly, and he doesn't really discipline them, and and that's a problem. So. Um, let's move on. We've only got a few verses left here. And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and afterward you hang him on a tree as a public example, his body shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall most certainly bury him on the same day, for he who is hanged is cursed by God so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now here's another interesting thing, and this is based on if. If he's put to death and you hang him on a tree. Not everybody is going to be put to death and hung on a tree. Probably because of their laws, most of them are going to be put to death and their body is going to be buried and gotten rid of right away because they have certain, uh, again, certain laws and certain ways that they handle dead bodies. So I don't think they would have done that a lot, but there may have been times where they felt like they needed to hang somebody's body as an example. However, notice, they're hanging a dead body, not hanging a living person. That's There's a difference there. And there's a note here. And I want to read this to you because I think it's a little interesting, kind of funny. In the time of the Roman Empire, the rabbis insisted that the Jews were more humane than the Romans because Jews did not use crucifixion as a means of execution. They maintained that only the corpse was hanged. So they thought that was nicer because they hung the corpse. <laughs> it just kind of strikes me as a little humorous. But they stoned them to death. I don't know that stoning would be the best way to die. And Paul even survived. He, he survived at least one stoning. And so I just don't know that this would be a good thing at all. Um, I guess it's better than crucifixion, I guess. If, but I doubt it because you just, you're going to be stoned to death. And I don't know how long it's going to take somebody to kill you that way. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. None of it's a good thing. It's a, that's why it's a punishment, right? Punishment is not supposed to be nice and happy and good and fun. So anyway, that is the end of Deuteronomy chapter 21. I want to thank you for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day. May God bless you and keep you safe. And remember, God loves you.